And if you are somebody, I said it yesterday, but if you are somebody who is interested in using your capital, your financial, emotional, or social capital to make the world a better place, find the organizations that empower the local people to be their full human selves. Everybody, we're the good doctors of Abbey Research. I'm Dr. Aaron. I'm Dr. Kristen. And you are so very welcome to our little corner of the internet where we are in the second part of our Colonizers World Tour coverage for this week or the second in this playlist on Haiti, which we are covering in the month of September 2022, basically because Haiti is a really cool place with a really complicated history. We covered it for one week last year on the Colonizers World Tour, and it wasn't enough. So we're back for four weeks of Haiti coverage, where we will have a specific topic we're looking at. This week is healthcare, and then we always have a piece of art. We try and find art that is related to the topic. With Haiti, we'll get into why that's very difficult to do. <laughs> Basically, the Haitian stuff doesn't get distributed. Um, around outside of Haiti. Uh, so we've got pieces of art about Haiti, but they're not always going to connect to the topic of the week. But today they do, because we are talking about the 2017 documentary Bending the Ark, which is available currently in the United States on lay Netflix. And it is an hour and 45 minutes of one of the most remarkable stories of human empathy perseverance, innovation, and determination I've ever seen. It is the literal story of the founding of the uh, nonprofit that we talked about yesterday, Partners for Health, Partners in Health, excuse me, Partners in Health, but that was founded in Haiti in the 1980s. The entirety of the documentary does not spend all of its time in Haiti, um, but really what they do in Haiti in the 80s and 90s becomes the model that they then move to other places around the world to provide health care in Peru and Rwanda and Sierra Leone and Liberia and all these other places. Um, and it, so it, is, it is that story. Uh, and we meet all the folks who were involved in that from the beginning. I think it tells you a lot about an organization too when you see people that have been there from the start and are still there. So I think like everyone who who was there uh, like the origin story of Partners in Health is still there except Dr. Jim Kim who left to go run the World Bank Group. So like it's not like he went to go private sector and like be become a private doctor. No, no, no. He went to like go champion what Partners in Health was doing to everyone and with a checkbook. Um, but Dr. Paul Farmer, who is one of the founders is there. Olivia Dahl is still there, all these people. Um, and that tells you, I think a lot about the work that they're doing, that the people still want to do it that, that, you know, 30, 40 years later. Um, so there's a lot of stories here, um, uh, that we're going to talk about, but w the one thing I want to make sure and bring up before we get into our own thoughts and feelings about this is kind of the revolutionary and the innovative vision of Partners in Health was that uh, basically the focus on helping people get access to healthcare in places like Haiti required an, an investment in the community and understanding in the community and a commitment that it would be community oriented healthcare, that it would empower people on the ground who are living there every day to help provide health care for each other. And specifically, um, what Partners in Health developed was a program of community health workers. 
uh, which they go in depth in explaining in Haiti was used to they they trained people from the villages that they were trying to serve to just basically be a healthcare buddy that was accountable would walk around and check on people talk to them ask them how they were doing remind them to take their medicine d- talk about any of the issues that they were having um and then communicate that with the staff at the partners in health clinics that they were running and it revolutionized healthcare in Haiti and it was such an anathema that it became uh it worked really well and then people when people heard about it they were like you want us to what <laughs> you want to do what that's not how ngos work that's not how healthcare works um and so uh it was uh, for me, just like, yeah, of course, why wouldn't you do that? Um, but it shows you a lot of the structural and systemic issues um, that we face in global health care and providing equitable health care. Uh, and so that was a big theme of this whole documentary. Dr. Kristen, what would you like to talk about uh, with Bending the Arc? Where would you like to go? Take me with you. <sighs> so... If you watch this documentary and you would like to know a little bit more about the early days of Partners in Health, there's a really great book called Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder, who spent a lot of time in Conge, which is the seat of uh, Partners in Health, and walked a lot of the roads and met a lot of the people and did a lot of it. It's an incredibly immersive book, and it is why I fell in love with Partners in Health and Dr. Paul Farmer. Um, I read it right. At, I read it as I visited a Partners in Health hospital for the first time in Rinkwavu, Rwanda, and I said it yesterday. Like I've tried to find something wrong with this thing, and I can't. So <laughs> it's. I mean, human foibles aside, they've had some scandals for sure. But like, you're a multinational NGO. Like you can't not fuck up sometimes. Um, but man, just the core of it. And I was, I was taken aback by what you said too, Aaron, that like at the core of it, it's like local people can take care of local people. Mm-hmm. It solved a ton of problems. You didn't have 12 people traipsing into the clinic. You had one to go pick up every week, the medication for the village at that, at that place. We see this all over the world. I mean, the UK, the NHS provides home health workers because people want to stay in their own home mm-hmm. and be among their own people and get healthier. So we don't do it in the in the U.S. Um, because healthcare here is an absolute apocalyptic nightmare. But a lot of other places understand it as really core. Um, but from an NGO perspective, it was um, this group of people who were aid workers and social scientists and medical doctors who came together and said, "How do we restore dignity through healthcare?" Mm. How do we how do we answer these problems? And one of the statements that Dr. Farmer makes in all of his books is we never treated a challenge as the end of the conversation. We always treated it as the beginning of the conversation. Yeah. And and when you said that, um, you said something similar in our in our 101 on healthcare yesterday that like most people, NGOs, governments, organizations, when they look at Haiti and they go, oh, God, Haiti is hard that was the end of the conversation that was and and that we see that pattern developing throughout kind of the the extension of partners in health um in haiti and then to other places you know they tell the story of of their work starting in lima peru and they were treating um tuberculosis patients even though apparently at the time Uh, Peru was claiming that tuberculosis had been eradicated and they didn't have people who were medicine um, drug resistant to um, to the drugs for for TB. Well, the PIH people get there and they are treating people who have tuberculosis and who have had tuberculosis for years and are taking the medicine and are not getting better. And so they they do the testing and they find that. They have strains of MDR-TB, which is, you know, drug-resistant tuberculosis, all throughout rural parts of Lima. And for so many people at the time, including the WHO, including the World Bank, uh, that was the end of the conversation. That, and like, literally, was, like, you see, you, see conver- you see documents where people yeah. say, we just have to let them die. Yeah, because... The, the MDR-TB 
uh, treatment was so expensive. And they were like, oh, well, we can't. There's no way we can possibly treat these folks in within the structure of their health care, their infrastructure, where they live, uh, you know, how they how they relate to health care and medicine. We just can't do it. So there was this acceptable death of all of these people um, because and a failure of curiosity and a failure of creativity and innovation. And Partners in Health walked in and was like, mm, we're going to do it anyway. We're going to figure out a way to do it because... All humans These people are, are human. dying. All humans are human, and everyone deserves the dignity uh, of healthcare. And the the one the one part that like broke the one part the first part that broke me in this documentary was when they were talking about their uh, MDRTB um, trial, and they had like two people, um, and one of them was this young man uh, who they had video footage of was very very ill really discouraged um, by the lack of advancing of his treatment. He kept taking medication. He wasn't getting any better. Um, and the community health worker was instrumental in just getting him to take his medicine. Um, and they showed a video of him talk like now, now, and he is healthy um, and still alive and talking. And Dr. Kim just starts crying. And he said to think that we almost let him die because it was inconvenient for us. Yeah. But what we learned is that that decision is made all the time in global healthcare. All the time. Yeah. And it makes what it makes what Partners in Health did that much more r- sadly radical. <laughs> and what I, the thing that I really want to talk about is Tom White, and he's like the person that we never talk about when it comes to Partners in Health, but mm-hmm. he bankrolled it all. Yeah. He bankrolled oh. it all. Because you know, what this takes is money. Mm-hmm. And I talk to a lot of people all over the world all the time who are like, I don't know what to do with my impact. I can't go hug babies in different countries. I can't do it all. It's like, well, that's cool because they just need you to write checks. Like, you don't have to get on a plane. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go to a fundraiser. You don't have to read a book. You have to click, like, monthly donation on the PayPal. That's it. That's what they need. And... He just said it was like we meet him early. Oh, we don't meet him because he's passed, but we meet his character. And Paul just said he and his wife didn't want to die with any cash in their hands. Yeah. So he just he just bankrolled it all. I guarantee you that Tom White probably never made it to Haiti. Hmm. And he probably never met anybody whose life he impacted. But he by willing by opening up his wallet, he just said, right, the world's going to change. And what I also appreciated with him, too, is when at some point he went back and he goes, I don't have as much cash anymore. I've given you guys everything I have. So let me make some phone calls. Yeah. And let me find you the money. Yeah. And, and he took out a, a loan. He took out a loan. Yeah. And used his house as collateral. Used his house as collateral. Okay. What I have learned in international aid work is that the money is never the problem. Mm. You can always find the money. It's how do you spend it? Have you built the trust to get it? And what are, how are you accountable to that money that you, that you spent? That's yeah. it. Yeah. And I mean, it just shows you, the documentary shows you the necessity. You have to take the time to invest in communities and embed in communities and speak to people. I mean, one of the the things that shocked me early on, um, but tells me a lot about the kind of person that Paul Fa- Farmer was, was that the first time he went to Haiti, uh, or the first time like f- the, so he met some of his friends in Haiti, he was working there, and he spoke Haitian Creole. He learned Haitian Creole so he could speak to people and provide health care. It's not easy. It's not French. And, but he didn't want to speak through a translator. He, he probably, he probably knew it was very hard to find somebody who was willing to come down there and translate. It doesn't build as much trust if you have a translator in a room and you just want somebody to tell you what's going on with their body and with their health. And I think when you put humans first in the equation, 
um, and you consider healthcare a human right, you don't really have a different way you can operate. You either believe that or you don't fully. Um, and there's lots of, of organizational complications that they run into. I think for me, one of the biggest lessons from this documentary too was the difference between top down approaches to problem solving and bottom up. And, you know, we are children of the 80s. So we weren't around in the 70s for a lot of the World Bank shenanigans. So learning in this documentary that the World Bank at the time in the 70s, not now, was one of the biggest problems because they went into a lot of these post-colonial states, they gave a lot of money, and then they put a lot of restrictions on paying back those loans. I loved that we decided that everyone should be in austerity because they didn't manage their money like we did. That was wild to me. Like that was, when, when uh, Reagan made, they had the video of Reagan making that speech. I was like, yeah. why are you declaring austerity in another country? Yeah. And, and to do it as a colonizer to countries that had been colonized and not factor in colonization on why they perhaps haven't had a great economy. Yeah. That, that absolutely baffled me that they were like, Okay, so we're going to give you this money because we recognize that you need it. But we're also going to attach a very high moral and actual cost to this. Yeah, like the and, interest rates that they were charged are nuts. And it was, and what it did was it forced them to cut the things that always get cut in austerity, which is healthcare and education. Yep. And yeah. To me, I was just like, and you have all of these, we think because, you know, global healthcare, global economy, that the best way to treat situations like this is to have huge organizations with big pots of money or huge organizations with a lot of resources like the World Bank, like the WHO. Um, but this documentary is the, the best case study in like, no. You, what it really takes is a, a handful of humans who can find the resources, who do the work from the ground up, because the results in Haiti are just Insane. spectacular. Yeah. Spectacular what Partners in Health was, was able to accomplish. And I don't, I think I, I don't know that I've ever been as emotional watching one of our documentaries as I was when the... Citizens of Cange wrote a declaration. Yeah. Called it the Declaration of Cange. And called a press conference. And this was in the... Um, AIDS. At the, the start of the AIDS. Uh, the start of the, of the AIDS crisis. And um, the P P Partners in Health Doctors published an article wrote an article that got published in the Lancet aforementioned yesterday, uh, one of the, you know, world renowned medical journals. Um, and it got, and how they helped combat the AIDS crisis in Haiti. And it got lambasted. It got criticized. It got massive mind. I loved this mindset and institutional obstacles that were enormous. And the people of college were like, no. This is how the program worked. And this is what we, we are pledging to continue to fight for all our brothers and sisters around the world. And their motto, that kind of their motto became, all humans are human. And like watching the footage of them reading that declaration in this tiny little room in Kaj, I was like, bro, <laughs> buckets. It was so... It's just so energizing to see this, too, as well. Yeah, I think it's, like, one of those times where I was just like, oh, we're not the only ones who think this way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Like, <laughs> oh, good. We're not alone. Um, and look, here's evidence-based practice that treating people with dignity leads, yeah. to, uh, leads to economic and social regeneration. Um, I just, I've been studying development for a long time. I have worked in so many NGOs and I've sat in the living room of so many people around the world who were beneficiaries of NGOs. And it is so stark. 
when you're sitting with somebody who's opening up their home to you, you can tell the difference of somebody who's been programmed to treat you like royalty or like a guest because they have to be thankful for you. And somebody who's already been told that you believe in their dignity and worth and you just want to get to know them as a human. And the difference of being in those rooms is utterly massive. And the sustainable growth happens with the latter and not the former. Yeah. And we've done the former for so long. And, you know, nothing is all black. Nothing is all good. Nothing is all bad. Or like we talked a little bit offline about the fact that like we have global AIDS funding because of George W. Bush, the war criminal. Um, <laughs> and we have George W. Bush decided to get on board with um, AIDS funding, supposedly because of Bono, one of the greatest public enemies on the island of Ireland. Um, humans are complicated. Mm. So, like, the legacy of, of missionary colonization is fraught. We did, like, missionaries did terrible things, and they did wonderful things. And the best thing that we can hope is that we have more organizations like Partners in Health now that we've learned it can work. They, we, we all stand on the shoulders of past giants. It's how it works. We didn't know better in 1870. We know better now. So let's, let's keep moving forward. Let's go forward. And if you are somebody, I said it yesterday, but if you are somebody who is interested in using your capital, your financial, emotional, or social capital to make the world a better place, find the organizations that empower the local people to be their full human selves. Mm -hmm. Because those are the ones that make the real lasting change. I'm tired of being in living rooms and where I'm given a Coke because I'm the white person who's going to save their entire life. Mm. And I can never get in enough living rooms where a baby is plopped on my lap because they already know that I love them as a person. And those are real different rooms. And I've been in both and I'm tired of the first one. Yeah. And it, you know, it is what, what we alluded to a little bit. We have to change the mindset of how we think about global healthcare, of how we think about human dignity, of how we think about making a difference in the world. Um, and the beauty of that is when you change that mindset and when you recognize that dignity, you do change the world. Yep. And so that I think is, you cannot find a, a more important and possibly harder call to action than to change that mindset, but it is possible. And that's what this documentary showed us. And that's what, um, the fantastic humans at Partners in Health have shown us that when you do it, it works. When you do it, it has systemic change. It has structural change. It has lasting change. And that's the stuff we should be working for in whatever capacity we can. Um, so, it, yeah, it was just um, a remarkable story. You want to talk about building empathy? left, right, and set, like, just the empathy was just coming at me all places, all places with this. Um, so we cannot recommend Bending the Arc enough. Um, it, we hope it is as inspirational and activating for you as it was for us uh, in hearing this story. Um, do you have anything else, Dr. K, or shall I wrap us up? Wrap us on up. Let's do this. All right, we are... Uh, done for this week in Haiti. Next week, we will be talking about voodoo. And if you don't think that intersects with our discussion this week about healthcare, you would be oh so very wrong. So we will be exploring voodoo next week. And then uh, our piece of art film isn't specifically about voodoo, but it deals with some magical realism and, and elements of Haitian culture and society that should be quite a fun exploration so please do join us for that next week or next in the playlist. In the meantime, please do all of the youtube -y things. If you enjoyed this conversation, let us know in the comments below. Like, subscribe, click the bell so you don't miss any more of our awesome conversations. If you would like to hear from us offline, we would love for you to join our weekly newsletter. And the link for that will be in the show notes below. So... I am Dr. Aaron. I hope you have a wonderful day, and we will see you next time. Bye, everybody.